Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome live to Talladega Speedway for this 25-lap non-point shootout. I'm Will Vincent. Joining me in the booth today is Glacier TV's very own Yoni Backman. Hello, Yoni. Oh yeah, we've done two endurance races so far, one on the road, one on the Roval, and now it's to the Oval, 25 laps of Talladega. Um, this is going to be a pretty interesting race for this BLR um, B-Class series. Indeed it will, and uh, I've never actually uh, had a chance to see nationwide cars going at it in uh, Talladega. I've also, also uh, often uh, used to see trucks in here, so um, especially with the new aero model, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the drafting works around here. Oh yeah, and if you haven't seen a um, uh, plate race on iRacing the last couple of weeks, then the two-car tandem has arrived. Um, so a completely different style of racing as in real life. Um, so we're currently having a look through qualifying at the moment. The lap times are going to be coming on very soon. We're going to take a little bit of a look in a second at the number 26 machine of Bob Beer, who's just starting his first lap as we speak, running amongst the wall for the first of two qualifying laps. Drivers are going to do that just so they can get as much fuel burn and also get maximum speed coming onto their flying lap. Indeed, I mean, that, it, it's actually, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, super speedway racing, it's actually um, quite surprising how long it takes, even though these cars are uh, extremely powerful, it's like s near 600 horsepower, it still takes a uh, good two laps to get fully up to pace and uh, uh, even the um, even uh, burning a fuel a bit and uh, getting the tires properly up to temperature means uh, quite a bit in, in the uh, lap times. We're talking about thousands of a second that makes the difference. Yeah and as you see the times will start coming onto your screen momentarily. Um, most of these times are not going to be representative of what the final grid is. As you see, Bob now um, coming down to that low line. He's going to run what's called a qualifying line for this money lap. Holding it down to the yellow line, down the corners. And then up to the middle lane down the back straight away. Get himself a nice turning arc as he goes into turn three. You see the car starting to move to the left. You want minimal steering input here so you lose as little speed as possible. And then you'll see him drive the car off the corner going out of four. Yep, and uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to see cars going... Well, I'm not sure actually sure if, uh, if the series has a demand of not going below the yellow line, but uh, I've seen couple, quite a couple of times people going below the yellow line just to try to, in the very last lap, just to try to save that one extra thousandth of a second. But uh, th there's actually a um, very, very um, big difference between... Uh, the, the the two lines. If you cut, if, if you just try to stay two inside, if you if you get to the apron in the mid corner, that's a good thing. But if you try to force your car to stay in the very inside of the track to, for too long, you lose like one extra mile per hour, and uh, that tends to give you quite a bit of plus around the racetrack. Oh yeah, one mile an hour on the track that's flat out all the way around, especially with restrictor plates, so it takes so long to build that speed back up is worth a lot. As you see, Bob currently sitting in the second position with a 53.679 lap time. Davis Hessler sets the fastest time so far, 53.469 in the number 16 machine. Yep, the order is currently running in the ticker for you guys, so um, I'm currently following Ryan Wells here, he's on a fast lap. And Danny Hugel now to the pole position with the lap time of 53.279 momentarily taking the lead. And 18 cars are currently set qualifying times of some sort. A couple of drivers are still about to set their flying laps. We expect faster times from Russell Knobloch, uh, Matthew Spangler and Ryan Wells. Yeah, and it seems that uh, they only get uh, one full flying lap because uh, every car that uh, has crossed the finish line has uh, pretty much hit the brakes right after the uh, right after they get got across the finish line. As did Ryan Wells, 
currently in eighth position. So we're qualifying over the field set for this race will be Danny Hugel lining up on the inside of row number one with a qualifying time 3.279. Behind him you have David Hisler with a 53.4 and then Bob Breer lines up in row number two alongside Scott Ekrich, Josh Brimecombe and Jared H. Torres lines up in row number three. Row number four will be Camilla Keister and Ryan Wells. Tony Scapali and Corey Card in row number five. Joe Foote and Brandon E. Williams lines up in row number six. Hunter Carl Odney, I think, um, and Sam Adams line number seven. Ken Foster, Blake Bryant, row number eight. Russell Nock and Matthew Spangler, row number nine. And Christopher Shaler, John Becker, David Forsett, Sam Watson and Ty France didn't set a qualifying time. We'll line up in positions 19 through 23. Indeed, and a total of 23 cars around the field, and uh, a slightly bigger field than uh, we used to see. I mean, uh, in the normal truck series, we tend to see 20 cars at maximum uh, around this racetrack, and now we have 23 cars. And um, yeah, my bad. It was a two qualifying lap session, by the way. So, uh, but I think the first lap counts, uh, the out lap counts. So uh, the second lap uh, uh, will probably be slower anyway. But yeah, it was a two lap run, not a one lap run. So we're just waiting for the field, uh, for every car in the field to get ready, and uh, we get the pace car to lead the way. And it's just a completely different style of racing since this latest aero upgrade uh, and draft change I racing. The two car tandem racing that you've seen so much in NASCAR over the last two, three years has come over to I racing. So you will see drivers literally running nose to tail in pairs of twos throughout the race um, however you'll see them switch about after about five laps as the engine of the car behind starts overheating and that will be the, one of the critical points seeing the drivers um, pairs that manage to make that switch work the best will probably be the ones that end up somewhere towards victory lane indeed and that, that's actually going to be very interesting to see um, I, I'm yet to uh, race my first uh, super speedway race uh, after the latest build came out and uh, I've seen uh, usually after the builds uh, the super speedway guys have always been the first ones to complain about a new build and this time I've only seen positive feedbacks of it so I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm pretty sure they nailed it well while some some uh, the white purple car uh, had his uh, quite <laughs> Quite a funny moment there. I, I think it was in fourth place, and he just flew around the outside of uh, everyone, and maybe a bathroom break or something. <laughs> Seen that happen quite yeah, often. Yeah, 22 car, and also Brandon Williams, and the starting in the 12th spot had internet connection issues. He has now reconnected, but he will be starting from pit lane if he can get back into the server in time. Cautions are on in this 25 laps, so cautions will normally last four laps if we have any. And it'll be interesting to see whether all the drivers, as the 22 car comes back around after making his very quick toilet break, uh, whatever it was, um, to regain that second in the outside row. Yeah, and as, as I was going to say right uh, when the uh, 22 car made his, uh, had his funny moments, I was going to say that uh, pre in the previous builds, uh, usually Talladega has seen a, a double file racing with uh, neither... neither um, neither side really gaining any advantage uh, I mean uh, it's been like 10 plus 10 cars uh, I mean any car any um, amount of cars uh, above five has been uh, irrelevant and um, well uh, naturally alone if you race alone around this track it's um, slower much much slower than uh, than it's uh, with the drafting but I'm thrilled to see how this race is gonna play out we're getting ready for green flag and the 72 car will bring the field down towards the start finish line and this 25 lap shootout here for the VLR series green, green, green. is green and you see immediately the 22 and the 6 trying to hook together but the 16 dives to the inside as it comes to turn number one leaving the drafting partner on the outside the fourth place pink car of Scott Egbert out to dry 
will be interesting to see since it's only a 25 lap shootout. It's not an endurance race this time around, unlike uh, the two uh, two broadcasts uh, earlier today. So we are talking about only a 25 lap race. So if it goes full green, which I, for some reason, I have small doubt about it, but if it goes full green, we're looking at uh, about 20 minute green flag race. So it's going to be a very very sprinty race and. Uh, as we can see, the top two runners already starting to form up a two, a two car pack and uh, three, four, five places, uh, trading places a little bit, and uh, they're not up to this kind of drafting, and it seemed to cost them a little bit. Watch the two cars coming out on the outside lane. I believe that is the number 17 of Tony Scabali being pushed up the racetrack, and he's going to be making a ton of positions up as they come back into. Turn number one to complete lap one onto lap two and the 72 and the 16 really have started to break away here. Just shows the might of the two car tandem. Indeed, and the other two car tandem is already uh, pulling a very, very fast outside line. They've reached the very edge of the track near the barriers but didn't clip any of it. But now we have a two car train, four car train followed by outside lane of two cars. So, um, what do you think? Those guys will be able to um, get past the uh, chasing five car group in the inside lane? It does seem that they're not properly connected on that outside lane. They need to get a little bit closer together, keep a little bit better in the corners if they're going to have the chance of making that work. But they seem to be dropping back at the moment whether or not they're going to try and build the momentum coming into the next lap. The, fifth, the 35 car seems to keep on disconnecting as they go into the corners and that's costing them a ton of time stuck out there on the outside. Yeah, the drafting partner of uh, Tony Scalpelli in the screen right now is uh, doesn't seem quite s quite so comfortable uh, being behind the car. He, he's obviously having a hard time to naturally uh, spot what's happening and uh, when's the corner coming up. But some people are just naturally better at this than the others because they know around, they know the track very well. They know the exactly the rhythm of uh, when to turn into the corner, when to straighten the corner. Since if you're following the car that close, as we can see right now, you cannot really see anything, can you? The 38 thought that the 7 was going to push him around on the outside. The 7 dives down to the inside to steal the position, you could almost say. But it looks as though, for now, it looks like the two-car breakaway of Danny Hugo and Davis Hessler is kind of being bolted by this pack behind them. They've not really been able to gain the advantage you'd expect this early in the race. Indeed, and uh, currently we're watching three, uh, two, even three whites going through the corners uh, for, with the two-car pack. So uh, the pairing of the car seems to be uh, th this seems to, new build seems to be uh, providing a very interesting uh, perspective for uh, super speedway racing uh, from here on out because uh, this looks way different than it has looked for the last two years in uh, around the uh, super speedways in Talladega and Daytona and. Uh, this is looking like this is any, every, anyone's race. All it takes is a one caution and it can all go away. And the 35 car almost almost clipped the um, left rear quarter panel. He just grazes the wall there of the 17 car ahead. This two car town is still not working perfectly together. They keep on making a little bit of ground and then disconnect and lose it all the way back stuck on the outside lane. But you see now the two cars of Danny Hugo in the 72 and David Hissler in the 16 have pulled away to about six tenths of a second. And when we go back, it, third place, Scott Eckwich is on the charge with um, Corey Card right behind him in fourth, trying to push his way up to that first two. Yeah, this at this stage it's gonna be it's gonna look like uh, pointless to even try this. These guys and at, at they're flying at, at the front because the top two are running 50.25s, whereas the third place runner Scott Air Eckridge is uh, uh, will last lap 50.2 and uh, Scott Eckridge did a 51.18, so nine tenths of a second, almost a full second faster than the cars behind. These guys are flying. The two cars up front, even though they're probably going to need to change in the next couple of laps. They're pulling away from what is three and four eyed racing behind. Very close, you see there, with the car on the drone down to the middle. I believe that is the 36 machine, if I'm not correctly mistaken. Almost got loose there. And you see the two cars, the 51 and the 88, trying to get around on the outside lane, but not quite hooked together. They need to get their front and rear ends perfectly aligned to be able to get this maximum draft. And the 51 decides that he's not in a comfortable position and pulls to the outside lane to see whether he can get himself a better drafting partner. Yeah, and it looks like the 
rest of the pack has uh, pretty much forfeited the way victory fighting for this race. The the first two top two runners are, are if it goes full green this way, the top two is going to be disappear in the horizon. And uh, there's uh, but <laughs> I I wouldn't mind very much having this fight for the win of the race. But it's it looks like this is going to decide the third place and. Uh, Huge pack of three white cars going into turn th turn three. This is awesome. And uh, while the last yeah. last lap, Bob Bieber uh, from sixth place uh, managed to pop himself back into third place, and now from third place in during one lap, he's dropped back into ninth. So, <laughs> lots of trading places in, uh, during one one or two laps. The eight, oh, the we have a ball contact. Wall. 99 keeping it steady. It looks as though we might just about be able to stay green. The 99 car there just gets loose while pushing the 88 car, loses the air behind him, and it looks like the 99 days is over. The caution is now out on the speedway. Yeah, let's have a look at exactly and what the secondary what went impact. On here. A big, big crash there in turn one. So we're currently with John Becker, who, uh, who was uh, involved in a uh, contact, and uh, he, well, he just he's following the leader of the pack, but. Did he get a push push from behind or something? Because he, that was a weird place to lose it uh, since he was uh, behind the pack leader. I mean, if, he, if he had been the pack leader, I would understand that, but that looked pretty weird. Yeah, I think we had two different impacts there. You had the 88 and the 99 causing the field to bunch up as people tried to avoid the 99. And then your secondary um, impact, which started the second wreck, was Sam Evans in the number 27 machine and Scott Akeritz in the 22 coming together fighting for literally a gap that just wasn't there with the zero one of David Forsich on the outside and that just started a multi-chain, multi-car accident that eliminated, I think by my watch, about six or seven drivers from contention. Yeah, John Becker, currently the, the wall contact guy uh, pulls into the pits and uh, his car is going very sideways and it looks like this, this race is going to be over. If not over, that uh, surely he's going to lose at least a lap. I mean, he, there's no way he can uh, he's able to repair that within the one caution period, so it looks like that, that race is going to be over. And we also have two other cars going into the pits and uh, one other guy is uh, throwing oil and smoke on the track. Yeah, the um, zero 09 car of Blake Bryan is smoking heavily in pit lane. His day is over. The pace car is bringing the cars around turn four at the moment. Pit lane, I believe, is open this time by, but I wouldn't expect to see any drivers come down pit lane in such a short race. Yeah, surely these uh, top two guys are not going to uh, drive into the pit lane. Uh, uh, one, pit, one pit entry, I think we saw. I wonder who it was, but... Um yeah, I I would suspect that these guys are flying so badly that uh, I'm pretty sure they're not going to risk their uh, the track position, especially if they're able to pull off immediately from the start with that kind of uh, that kind of pace. Uh, I'm not actually. Uh, uh, I wonder if you will uh, had the privilege of uh, actually testing it the super speedways uh, after the last build. Uh, how how the tires are going to look if you if you um, go with the old tires against fresh tires. I mean, restart is going to be uh, a bit of a problem for old tire runners, but uh, in terms of uh, first two or three lap uh, race pace, how is it going to look? Um, on such a short run, we found there's probably not that much of a difference. Fresh tires is good on a restart, but if you manage to hook up early, it doesn't really matter if you're on old tires or new. The critical thing will come if you've got more than five laps of green flag running, and you have to do the switch around and you're moving all the way behind the car behind you that's when new tires might become a little bit of a hint and we did see a number of cars head down pit lane the 22 the 35 the 26 the 54 the 01 the 27 02 and the 09 all down pit lane yeah i wonder if uh, there's uh, some small minor uh, repairs to be done or uh, whether they're just taking fresh tires and uh hoping to launch from the behind the pack right after the green flag flies and uh, currently we're in um, on lap 10 of the 25 lap race so this is a very very short sprint race and uh, Danny Hugel currently number 72 car is leading the pack with the Davis Hessler his teammate obviously um, <coughs> uh, running in second place and uh, these guys were uh, just escaping the pack uh, second a lap so um, don't expect anything less from these two once the green flag flies. Um, 
uh, Camilla Keister uh, in third place at the moment, Corey Card in uh, fourth, Jared H. Torres completes the top five. And for Danny and Davies, caution actually came at just the right time because I believe they were about to do the switch over, which would have cost them about a second, second and a half. Obviously, it wouldn't have changed the complexion of the race, but the last thing they'd want to do is get a little bit more bogged down towards that pack as the caution was about to fly. But for these two, it means that the 16 can again tuck right at 72 on the restart and push them back into the distance. Currently we have uh, two cars in the pits, uh, Camilla Keister from uh, third position entered the pits, uh, Ryan Wells also entered the pits, uh, Hunter Coltney, uh, the very last place runner obviously taking repairs two laps down already uh, is uh, taking pits as uh, is in the pits as well and uh, John Becker and uh, Brandon E. Williams also from the behind the pack, They're, they decided to make a late pit stop. So we're working lap number 11 or 25 at the moment here at Talladega Super Speedway and it looks like we're going to be going green not this time but next time by so that'll be at the end of lap number 12. So it's almost as though you've had your first half of the race, you've got to figure out who you can run with and now time to do another 12 and see if you can find yourself a dancing partner. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, are the uh, all the rest behind the top two guys able to find anything in the pits or through some minor adjustments to find that huge gap interval between the top two and uh, and the rest of the pack. I mean, how, what can you possibly do to gain that much of a time? You can gain a little bit of an advantage by um, doing a wedge adjustment, but it's not going to be significant enough, I think, to think about catching the guys ahead. Um, a couple of guys, you know, for longer races will set up their car in such a way that they can make a mid-race pit stop adjustment, be it to tyre pressures or to the wedge, which gains them quite a bit of speed. But on such a short race, I don't think that many drivers um, anticipated having a caution or many cautions to make that much of an issue. So one to green about to come up and uh, the double file is going to form up again. As we see a uh, pace car in any second going past the start and finish line, they get one to green, so the cars will form up in um, double file for the restart. And um, like Will said, it's 50% uh, of the race done and uh, time to do the remaining half. And this is where team communication will really come in useful. And the 72 and the 16 will very likely be communicating their race start together. Um, the 16 probably wouldn't be allowed to dive into the inside lane until after he's passed the start finish line. However, the 72 will try and coordinate that start so that as soon as they pass the line, you can duck right back in behind that 72 and push them around the racetrack like they did for the first part of this race. So you're currently watching uh, Victory Lane Racing League, uh, first race of the season, but the uh, Unlike the uh, normal first races of the season, uh, you cannot sp score championship points for this one. This is basically just a kickoff round, uh, uh, like a welcoming round for the uh, new nationwide league. So uh, you don't score any championship points for this race, but it, uh, these guys still go right at it. They, they don't give anything for free. Almost like their version of the budget shootout, except you don't win a million dollars. Yeah, but uh, winning this race uh, means a million dollars to these guys. So, so uh, th this week uh, it's going to be this 25 lap Dega uh, race with a non-point scoring uh, event. Uh, but uh, next week we're going to have the f uh, first official race of the league underway, which is going to be Daytona Oval, another super speedway, uh, 35 lap lapper uh, that time around. Then uh, next week we're going to be at Atlanta for 45 laps, then Michigan for 25 laps next week. So very fast ovals in the first four races of the season. And very short races as well. So these guys have got to be on it from the word go. No worrying about, you know, tire wear or fuel economy or strategy. It's just a case of get out there and race. So pace car just about to pull into the pit lane and we're gonna get the remaining half of the race underway and we're just waiting for that green flag to pop up and expect Danny Hugel and Davis Hessler just make a f blistering start and uh, just disappear again or will they just spin a little bit too much and uh, lose it all the way we're just about to find out 
look for that 16 car to go right back into the inside line. You should see him do so immediately as they come back to green flag racing here at Talladega. David Hessler comes right back into the inside lane. You see a slow car down on the apron. Whether he's just letting the field go by him or not, I don't know. But three wide racing behind. And it's just going to be a matter of time before Hugel and Hessler hook back up as they do now and start to put away. Yeah, and uh, Hugel, Hugel just did an insane start. I mean, he just did like three or four car lengths uh, as soon as the green flag came out. I mean, that was that was like a picture perfect start from uh, Danny Hugel in the in the front of the field and uh, unlike in the last last uh, restart now the three four five positioning cars uh, are not that far behind they still got the draft yeah you can see a little bit of free wide racing going further on back in that pack couple of people trying to hook up two y um, two by two see if they can gain the advantage but so far the exception of Hugel and um, Hustler they're all running single file down the inside line. Indeed, and it will be interesting to see who is going to make the first initial move to move to the outside line if they get the higher group to, to working, because not in all setups you get the higher group to work at all. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, these cars, you know, some of these cars, depending on how your setup works, you see third and fourth start to hook up there. Uh, some of these cars will have to literally be running nose to tail for lap after lap just to be able to catch these guys, let alone not even think about passing them. And you try and see the free... They tried to do a free car tandem there. It just wasn't going to be working there. Corey Card, um, Torres and Spangler trying to do a free car tango. It just doesn't work with the second car not being able to see the car in front. The third car is just creating a disturbance. Yeah, Jared Torres had a huge moment there. Uh, he, he was with the very inside line and uh, one of the guys just had a, <laughs> almost a wall contact there because of the slight mistake made by a, or a slight disturbance caused by Jared's car. So yeah, that's that's not the way to go around this track and that cost a, whoever Jared hit there, that cost him a lot of places. And just to mention Hugo and... Seven. Yeah, sorry about you. Uh, Hugo and Hessler and uh, by, by the way, our teammates from HH Racing, so... <laughs> Just to mention and you see it. that, yeah, and you see that um, Corey Card and Torres have actually caught these the two car of um, Hugo and Hessler. So it looks as though you've got two different types of strategy working here. You have Hessler and Hugo doing the two car tandem. They're going to have to switch around in about two laps time maximum. Meanwhile, you have Card and um, Torres. Card looking to the outside now, seeing if he can get a dance partner to go with him. The 22 car looks like he's going to. The seven car looks like he's going to come up as well almost right to 47 but it's going to be a case of who's going to be able to pounce when these two need to switch over indeed and it, uh, that was an interesting move in the middle of the corner to move that 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 far from the outside because you tend to lose uh, quite a bit of ground if you uh, switch uh, switch the lanes in the middle of the corner and uh, especially when they uh, when the cars didn't do it simultaneously they uh, just lacked that extra half a second to form up the um, form up the tandem Couple of tandems forming further back on the racetrack. You have seventh and eighth, who is Sam Adams and David Forsett trying to work um, the middle lane at the moment. These two are probably communicating, saying, "Okay, we'll just want to qualify in line, so they know exactly where the driver is going to be come each exit of the corner." And that's where it really comes in handy: team communication, knowing exactly where the car is going to be entering and exiting the corner, is how you make this two-car tandem work. You can't just rely on instinct all the way. Indeed, you can. Uh, Corey Carter, uh, while at it, is uh, doing an excellent job with uh, uh, leading the uh, other tandem on the outside line. You can see the white car, white and purple car tandem going on the outside line, and they're actually currently lapping faster than uh, Hugel and Hessler in the, uh, in the front. They duck back into the inside line, and you can expect them to try and go to the outside, coming out of corner number four. Don't think they're quite going to have the momentum to make the pass unless that group behind them also comes to the outside lane. But at the oh. moment, it looks as though the... Oh, uh, so a card uh, almost loses it there. And this is where it's all going to get bunched up. We're going to be free wide going into turn one. Indeed, the high side line tandem loses it because of the too, too close contact of uh, between the two lines. And that was uh, just about as close as you can get before you get uh, seven cars in a one p a big pile of smoke. And four wide coming out of turn two, you see... On the move, I believe that is David Forich and Christopher Seller, the 01 and the 02 car, working as a tandem, trying to get up the field. And these cars are going to see now, they've got to try and get around the 07 car, 
He's going to try that his best possibly to tag onto the front of this group and separate those behind. Whether he's going to stay to the inside line or move up, it looks like he's going to stay down low. Yeah, and currently uh, and that, that K uh, Corey Card uh, incident just gave another yet another uh, chance for this uh, leading duo, Hugo Hessler, to just escape the pack again. And you can see as soon as they got rid of the draft, now they really started pushing it. And all, already it's 0.6 of a second to the third place under David Forge. And uh, Corey Card from third place for that small mistake dropped down to ninth. And you have a third tandem running right now, as you can see on the screen. I believe that is the 99 and the 88 working together. We saw these two working together in practice. That is Kesta and Bieber working down on the inside line. It's a 0 1 and 0 2 disconnect where they're making the switch over. But now it looks as though, at the moment, it is still um, Hugo and Hessler leading the way with. At the line to complete lap number 19, it's going to be Tesla and Bieber third and fourth. Yep, and the last lap, John Becker, who was leading uh, uh, Becker Kaiser duo, uh, currently he actually outpaced Hugo and Hessler by 0.2. So the leading pack, leading uh, tandem, is not getting escape. So let's see whether these tandems can actually close down. Hessler and Hugel, it's, chances are these two are going to have to make a switch at some point soon. But whether or not they've been pushing too hard or just letting the engine cool by moving to one side and in the corners while they've been getting away, but they've still got themselves a good six tenths of a second gap. Oh, and, and you see that the 07 car oh, we've got a crash. around onto the apron. The yellow flag is out. And this could be the end of the race. Indeed, I think it was Jared Torres, if I'm not mistaken, who was involved in the spin. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. No. Was it Jared Torres? I believe the Series 7 car was involved. Yeah, the Series 7, Jared Torres, was the one who went around there. Um, turned around, I believe, by the 26 car getting loose behind him. Or, no, sorry, what actually happened was they caught the cars ahead of them, the um, tandem working there of Becker and Keister, and the 07 car just lost the air as he tried to move to the outside lane and got turned around. Yeah, let's try to have a look at uh, what actually happened there. Okay, let's try to get a view from uh, John Becker. And, uh, yeah, well, tough to say from that position, it's... Um, the replay just popped in while it, while the accident was already happening, but um, yeah, I mean we had we saw that happening three times already, and uh, it was like I said, it was inches away from uh, making a caution, and uh, now that was the extra range, and now we have a caution. I think for um, the zero seven car, um, he tried to move to the out to the middle lane. He just hit um, Keister. Ever so slightly coming down the front stretch, and just as he moved up, I think he might have either caught, just slightly caught the rear bumper, or lost the air of the car in front, and it just um, threw him around. Snap um, looseness there on the car, and game over for him and his um, running partner. Indeed, and actually, I was uh, just as the, the wreck happened, I was watching the, um, the second tandem around the racetrack. I think it was. Keister's, uh, Keister's tandem, and they were actually uh, amongst those uh, three tandems that were uh, uh, forming up behind the leading pack, uh, or the leading two cars, they were actually the slowest and they were in the front, so I'm pretty sure that has something to do with the uh, main, main straight incident. Yeah, they, uh, <coughs> that um, tandem of Beckett and Keister was being caught mightily quickly by that tandem of Torres um, and his running partner, so... This is the thing, you need to be able to preempt your moves here at Talladega with this two-car tandeming. And again, it comes back to the communication. You need to be able to tell your running partner when you're going to move up to the middle lane, when you're going to go to the outside, when you're going to come down low. Because the car behind cannot see anything at all to the car in front. And it really does mean you need that communication. And you also need to plan your moves so you know that when you can move up or move down to maximize your speed and drafting advantage, while at the same time, being able to keep your position on the racetrack. The pace car currently uh, 
leading the pack and I'm pretty sure we're not gonna see any pit stops right now we're currently on lap 19 amongst the leaders uh, two cars be uh, one lap down Ken Foster and Hunter Colony one lap down but I'm pretty sure we're not gonna see any pit stops now because that would cost a severe amount of track time um, sorry to correct you we're currently at the end of lap number 22 oh shoot my bad my scoring system is screwed so yeah updated right now so end of lap 22 so we're gonna have a few lap shootout. And hopefully we'll get the at least a two to go sign this time by. I'm not sure we're gonna get the one to go. Yeah, it would be uh, more pleasant for the viewers to see one to go right now. But uh, either way, I think it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a classic Talladega thriller. Five lap, less than five laps, and uh, everyone piled in behind the pace car. Um, by my reckoning, we're going to literally get a white and a checkered. We're on lap 23 now. Unless they have, um, and it was coming down from trackside that they didn't get the two to go this time by. So that will be the end of the race if um, our scoring is correct. Indeed it will, and uh, that would be a disappointment because that one lap shootout would have been a thrill, one uh, hell of a thrill to see because uh, before the, uh, the small contacts started to be made uh, around the, uh, the leading pack, the front two did, were not escaping as well as they did in the early stages of the race, but yeah, if, if, it's, uh, if the calculations are correct from your, what you just said, it's going to be a disappointment because, uh, well, <laughs> not disappointment for the Team Double H, but still, um, yeah, sa always, always sad to see a race end up uh, behind the pace cars. But currently, we are on lap 23, so uh, two full laps to go, and uh, we still are yet to see the two to go. So, in, in, if that's the case, then Danny Hugel will take the victory of the uh, non scoring race, uh, the first race of the Victory Lane Racing Nationwide Series. So, no championship points for this race, but lots of glory and million dollars. <laughs> and uh, so, Hugel will take the uh, kickoff round win, Hessler will take second, John Becker third, Kimila Keister uh, fourth, Corey Card fifth, Scott Eckridge sixth, Bob Bieber seventh, Christopher Schella eighth, David Forge ninth, Sam Adams completes the top ten behind the pace car. Um, but to say that though, the um, two guys out front have been the class of the field all day long. You know, it took them a couple of laps, but each time they just managed to drive away by about six, seven tenths from the field. And no one seemed to be able to catch them. Uh, I'm not even sure that these two were even pushing that much. Yeah, that pace they uh, set up before the first caution was just is simply insane. I mean, they were uh, one, uh, even two tenths around this racetrack is like a light year and these guys were escaping one second a lap that that that's just unheard of so just, just to confirm the lights still on the pace car so you would still get two more laps of caution here which is a bit strange because um, it seemed like they caught the pace car pretty quickly and I would have presumed pit lane would have been open rather quickly so it's unfortunate that the cautions lasted this long um, but again, it doesn't detract from the fact that Hugo and Hessler really were the um, class of the field tonight. Indeed, that was a, almost looked like a different car class uh, involved in the top, um, with the top two guys. But still, uh, yeah, I have to say that these guys have done an awesome job of setting the car up and uh, must have taken like hundreds of laps of practice because uh, like cutting like I said in the beginning of the race cutting hundreds and thousands of a second from the setup is uh, takes uh, more work than uh, more people uh, most people give these guys credit for but I mean getting that much of a gain uh, that's like uh, cannot cannot give enough respect to these guys for setting up those cars and let's not forget also that we are literally just weeks away from the <clears throat> um, first, um, sorry, from the iRacing um, Daytona 500, which will be held on the brand new laser scanned Daytona race service, which um, <clears throat> now they've rescanned it, it's very much in line with real life. So the bumps are gone, the two car tandeming is upon us, 
And you're going to see a lot of that working, especially in the upper split races for the World Tour event, which is being held, I believe, this year over two days. Indeed, it will. And uh, there was a lot of requests um, from the initial date that it was uh, supposed to be run on. And uh, a lot of people were complaining that, that they were unable to attend that race. And uh, they, therefore, uh, um, based on both uh, time zone problems and um, weekdays, they just decided to run uh, two events. So we're going to have uh, new pavement for the Daytona 500. So the entire oval side of the Daytona has been re uh, rescanned and re uh, since it's um, repaved and uh, pavement has been remade in real life. So they rescanned the track and uh, much less bumpy, I hope, this time around. And um, Indeed, tw two times Daytona 500 coming up shortly. And let's not forget, not only does that affect the oval, but the road course also. Um, there's um, some night, uh, <coughs> night racing adjustments made to the road course, as well as the changes made to the bus stop chicane. So it'll be very interesting to see not only that for the Daytona 500, but also the 2.4 hours of Daytona being held um, next weekend. Yes, with... Uh uh, I think it's uh, Jeddah and Mazda and um, was there a third card involved, or was it just Jeddah and the Mazda? I think it might be just the Jeddah and the Mazda for the Raw before the 24. Yeah, I actually uh, had it um, when the um, they fir the first practice servers uh, launched for the um, the Daytona Road event. I actually took the chance to just visit it with the uh, with the Mazda, and uh, it's actually pretty fun to drive. So. If anyone uh, is uh, available at that uh, at that weekday and uh, you enjoy uh, running non-open wheelers, uh, that that's going to be a fun event. If you have a <laughs> if you have a t uh, three or four bottles of water and um, some pack of smokes, maybe and all it ta all it takes for you to survive a 2.4 hours of straight sitting and racing, so that's uh, that's going to be a fun event to see and. Uh, not actually sure if uh, it's going to be broadcasted in uh, from um, uh, any broadcasting team, but it will be fun to see. So, if you oh yeah, definitely. If, yeah, if you're not uh, up for racing, it just uh, <laughs> if there's a broadcast, then for heaven's sake, join and uh, watch it. So the race is now finally official. Danny Hugel wins from David Hessler, who finishes in second. John Becker third. Um, I'm um, going to get my scoring box off. Um, Kimula Keister in fourth. Corey Card, fifth. Um, Scott Akerich in sixth. Bob Bieber, seventh. Um, Christopher Scheller in eighth. David Forsyth, ninth. And Sam Adams rounds up your top ten. And overall, 22 of the 23 cars ended up finishing on the lead lap after wave rounds and lucky dogs were taken into effect. Yeah, it's not a surprise uh, for the 25-lap sprint race at Talladega to see nobody, uh, almost nobody, uh, being lapped down. So, um, yeah, I was ex actually I was expecting a far more closer battle than what we actually saw, but still, uh, we saw quite a bit of a display of excellent teamwork. I mean, that, the, what the front uh, two guys did uh, in this race is. Uh, <laughs> something for uh, future super speedway guys to look after I mean that's that's how you're supposed to do it that's how you gain a ton of time and uh, just stay out of trouble and just make a uh, picture perfect and a pre uh, to the precision teamwork just make everything perfect follow the follow the other guy don't don't let the draft break and uh, yeah and, and especially don't let the guys behind you get the draft so these guys just did everything exactly like it, they uh, should do and now they're currently <laughs> uh, at the start and finish line doing not donuts but uh, just melting the tires and you'd have to say Hugo and Hessler favorites going into first points race of the season next week at Daytona yeah without a doubt and uh, the, uh, like I said the first four races are gonna be in a f very fast speedway so I don't expect nothing less from these two, the two guys in the uh, first four races if they are gonna attend all of them so don't forget, you've got, in the next three weeks, you will have the first race of points race of the season taking place at Daytona International Speedway, which I believe will actually be the new track 
um, which has been released this coming Tuesday if you are a Super Speedway fanatic. And then following on from that, you would have a race at Atlanta Motor Speedway and then Michigan. And I believe we have a couple of people in the booth for a couple of interviews. So a very hello to you, David, and who is that? Christopher. Hello. Hey, how you guys doing up here? Yeah, not bad. It's been a slightly interesting race. Um, it did seem like Hugo and Hessler were the class of the field managing to nail the two-car tandems, but you've had some interesting and entertaining races yourself. Yeah. Definitely oh, say yeah. that. Oh, yeah, it was definitely an interesting race tonight. And how did the two-car tandems work for you? Uh, we saw you guys working together a lot throughout the race in the first and second stint. Yeah, for us, we really um, felt like we were able to get hooked up pretty good on the high groove. Only problem we had was that we weren't able to quite swish the uh, switch efficiently as we could have. Yeah, it was good. Um, obviously, from the beginning, uh, I approached Christopher before the race, asking him if he wanted to join up, join me. And you no, know, it hooks up really well. They did a good job on the drafting. Um, just so much the uh, swapping, we didn't have enough time to practice that. So it was just kind of off and on for us. And when we had to switch, instead of just me dropping behind him, he had to come up. So that kind of threw us off as well. But the drafting is really awesome, and these guys are pretty fun to race with. And just how important is managing to nail that switch to <clears throat> being able to successfully mount a challenge towards the front? Oh, it is extremely important. If you don't nail that, you, you are dropping back like a rock. We went from fourth, I believe it was, maybe even third, way back to ninth when the caution came out. So it's important that you get out there and you just hook right back up. You can't lose as much speed as we did or you're just dropping back like a rock. Then you have to work your way back up and then short racing time, you don't have that much op option to do it. Uh, and uh, Sorry. Yeah, I was just about yeah. to ask that uh, Hugel and Hessler, the top two runners, uh, they did uh, like insanely fast lap times and at the beginning of the race they just disappeared one second a lap to the uh, compared to the rest of the pack. So uh, you guys have anything in your sleeve to uh, catch these guys uh, or match these guys in the um, upcoming uh, official races of the season? Practice. Definitely practice. We just really need to be able to keep our momentum up while we're switching. Besides that, I think we're just about even. But then again, those guys are really fast out there, so I'm not sure. I don't want to toot my own horn over here real quick, but we, we, we are pretty fast ourselves, Christopher. I ran a 49.596, the fastest out there. And yeah. you're going to Daytona um, next week. Um, I believe you're going to the new version of Daytona, which is released on Tuesday. Um, it's going to be very similar principles, but it's a much narrower track. And we saw... Some very, very close racing at times, which almost resulted in some big wrecks. Um, you know, Daytona with that much less room, how much import more important is it to find the space when you need to when you're tandeming up the field? Oh, it's definitely important. I mean, I've raced enough races at Daytona to know that you just don't have that much room. There's a big crash. There's almost nowhere to go. Yeah, pretty much is that. Daytona is a thin track to begin with, and when you're going out there, depending on if you're pushing or you're, you know, you're leading, the track looks so much narrower. So you're just like, ooh, I can't do this, I can't do that. But I mean, it's just really important to, you know, see see what's going on in front of you and just take it. It's not that much time to think, because especially at Daytona, we're gonna be up probably 199, 98 miles, probably 192, a little less than that. You now, so we're gonna be going fast, and we're gonna have to see that hole, and we're gonna have to go for it, just like a couple times today. And um, I'm going to bring Ryan into this conversation as well. Ryan Wells, who finished 15th overall in the race. Um, I mean, how difficult is it being the car pushing um, with that little visibility? I mean, you're literally just relying on hoping that the guy ahead of you goes to the place that you expect them to go almost half the time. Yeah, it's pretty difficult being in the big pack and then you have to push the driver and then when they're everywhere and then it's pretty difficult. Because then you're, you're trying to rely on, they you want them to go to that hole and they go the wrong way and then you get blocked up because other cars are slower that aren't hooked up. And with that sort of racing, I mean, obviously communication is so important. I mean, do you have to almost try and pre-plan your moves? Like, 
you know, a corner, a straightaway in advance to kind of hopefully preempt where you're going? Yeah, communication is a big key. Me and my teammate were talking about when we were going to come off the corner, when we were going to go high, but when me and my teammate Brandon, we, we were running, but I dropped back to the back to get him, and after that, he started um, blinking, and then we couldn't get hooked up, and then after that, we lost the pack. And uh, as I said to the other guys, going to Daytona for the first points race of the season um, next week, um, do you expect more of the same? Yeah, I expect more of the same. It's not as bigger of a track, but the racing will be the same, but not as wide. I don't think you're going to get like four wide as they were, but they ended up wrecking. And bring in race winner Danny Hugo into the booth. Congratulations on your win, Danny. And I'm guessing we also have to pay that in part to your teammate Dave Hessler um, from your um, team there. Um, great, great result for you, though. Thank you. We've been definitely working on this Tango thing since it came out about a week ago. And we were able to get a setup perfected pretty good and able to put it together in the race. And how much different are the setups now compared to what they were, you know, two, three weeks ago? You've had a change to the draft obviously as well as little bits here and there but is the same do the same principles apply or do you have to go down a completely different route now you kind of had to change it up because i raced and updated the aerodynamics to where the ride heights were a little bit different and that was pretty much the main key thing there's not really anything you can do about the uh tape and overheating though and you guys wanted so well to um, switch and you're pulling out at some point you know seven eight nine tenths of a second a lap um, I mean how did you manage to, um, I mean what method of communication were you using to you know figure out when to switch where to switch at what point to switch you know and where you feed back in uh, we pretty much agreed that we're gonna keep it on the yellow you know, yellow line all the way around and uh, if he got to 300 and the red light came on we're gonna try to swap real quick but thankfully, the uh, caution played out the way they did, and he was able to cool the engine down and just keep pushing. Uh, looking at the first three weeks of uh, official series, Daytona, Atlanta, Michigan, any uh, personal favorites, any of you guys, uh, What uh, of those three? Well, after how we ran at Talladega, I'd say Daytona's definitely a favorite. Uh, Michigan, we seem like we're pretty good at. Atlanta, I think, is definitely going to be the uh, FD one for us. I think we can get through it pretty good. What about you, Ryan? I'd have to say Atlanta. I just all the other tracks, some tracks I just don't get along with, like Texas. Even though Texas and Atlanta are kind of the same, but something about Atlanta, I just like. Yeah, I found what's that. Like, you know, despite you know Texas, Charlotte, Atlanta on paper being so similar tracks, just the way the car transitions are on and off the banking at Atlanta makes it so much more enjoyable to drive at times. And let's not forget, it's a slightly wider track with uh, the way the car goes through the front stretch kinks is also so much smoother. You can keep so much more momentum going into um, turn one. But, I mean, we've got the iRacing um, Daytona 500 just a matter of weeks away. And I'm guessing this race, um, the race next week, even though it's in a different car, surely is going to prove useful for formulating strategies for the biggest NASCAR race of the year. Yeah, I'd definitely say so. It's pretty much the same dynamic of uh, squaring up and going as fast as you can without overheating. Because since the 500, since it's you know, a much longer race, you can't really overheat it as much as you can in this race or else you won't be able to pull 500 miles. And any closing thoughts from any of you guys? Uh, yeah, I thank uh, my teammate, first of all, and uh, thanks for you guys for broadcasting and uh, Ryan for hosting the race. Now, I got to thank uh, my uh, temporary teammate here, uh, Christopher Shella. Uh, this is the first time racing together. We didn't get that much practice, but he did a really good job out there. Thanks, Ryan, for uh, putting on this league. I think I'm going to be back for Daytona and whatever, whatever else is after that. And thank you guys here at Glacier TV for putting on the broadcast.
Yeah, I would like to uh, thank Glacier TV for putting on this broadcast. I'd like to fa thank uh, David for helping me out, drafting with me. Uh, and uh, also like to thank Ryan for getting me introduced into this league and putting this all on. Really because of him, they're all here. So thanks, Ryan. And uh, we'll be back at Daytona and hopefully run for the championship. Well, thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk to us this evening, guys. And don't forget that you'll be able to full the um, beautiful race on GlacierTV.com um, in a couple of hours' time, if not less, whenever Yoni decides to stop drinking beer. Um, but thanks so much for the good racing, and we'll see you all next week at Daytona. Beer? I hate beer. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Indeed, the uh, post-race uh, videos are going to be visible within a couple of hours in uh, Glacier, GlacierTV.com in the video yeah. archives. So enjoy uh, all of the three of the tonight's broadcast. We had two road races, one on oval, roadside, one on roval, and then we had the current event that was a uh, Talladega 25 left sprint race. So uh, from Will Vincent and J Johnny Beckman and uh, the four guys four that uh, came up for short interviews. Thanks guys and uh, can't wait to get back for more. It's a wrap.